the first millennium BC. In the immense steppes, deserts and forests of Northeast Asia, a storm is gathering. Groups of nomadic warriors, ferocious mounted archers, fast like lightning on their horses, suddenly appear on the northern frontiers of Chinese kingdoms. Their unpredictable and deadly reds wreak havoc on villages, towns and cities, but they vanish before they can be confronted. In response, the Chinese start building walls to discourage them or slow them down enough to organize their defense. The walls spread dozens then hundreds, then thousands of miles. But the threat never entirely disappears, and centuries pass. Earthworks, wood and adobe are replaced with brick and stone. Kingdoms and empires rise and fall south of the wall. For more than 2,000 years, and the masters of China repair and expand the wall when they can. No construction site in the history of mankind was ever larger or lasted longer than this one. The wall ran from the sea in the east to the center of Asia in the west, crossing plains, forests, steppes, mountains and deserts, becoming a web of old and new constructions that was too large to be maintained and manned all the time. Long portions of the wall, the oldest ones, were even forgotten by the descendants of their builders. Finally, construction stopped in the 17th century. The imperial throne of China was taken by a dynasty coming from the other side of the wall, the Qing, the last rulers of imperial China. Hello everyone. This is the story we are going to explore tonight, and with it, 2000 years of Chinese history. I will tell you about the Great Wall itself, why and how it was built, by whom, and through it we will follow the rise and fall of dynasties in ancient China, the blooming, the transformations and convulsions of Chinese civilization. If you are interested, I already told you about other related stories, especially one about the Mongols, and another one about the Forbidden City in Beijing, and the last 500 years of Imperial China. You will find links in the description. But this can wait. For now, if you stay with me, we're going to travel back in time several thousand years into the past. And all you have to do on this journey is relax and let me do the work. You can adopt a comfortable position, sit or lie down, and just for a short moment, scan your body for tensions that you can release in your neck and your shoulders, your arms and your legs, 
you don't need that, so gently let go of these tensions. If you fall asleep during the story, there are always timestamps in the first command to come back later where you left it. In the first command, you will also find links to audio streaming platforms like Apple Music or Spotify, if you prefer to listen on them. There are already dozens of stories available, and they are audio only, but you don't need visuals to follow along, so feel free to always close your eyes at any time when you listen to my stories. And you will also find the link to my Patreon page. If you wish to support this channel, download audios and videos, listen to my stories as podcasts, and access updates and surveys I post there. But we are not in a hurry and you can check all this later. For now, take one single deep breath, and off we go. The Great Wall had a lot of different names along Chinese history, and we will see it is not a single wall, but rather a collection of fortifications from different periods. The name Great Wall of China became used in English or French in the 19th century, but nowadays in China it is called the Long Wall Changcheng or in a longer form Wanli Changcheng, the 10,000 mile Long Wall these miles do not refer to the English mile, but to the Chinese mile, the Li, L-I, which for centuries in ancient China was not defined very precisely. Its length was about a third of an English mile, or half a kilometer. But 10,000 miles here is not about the precise length of the wall. It is used figuratively to indicate a very, very long distance in the sense of immeasurable. So the name could be translated more accurately by saying the immensely long wall or the never-ending wall. And indeed, it was unthinkable for someone in China to ever see each portion of the wall. According to modern measurements, if all the sections were put together into a single wall, it would be long enough to connect the two poles. Its length would be about half the circumference of Earth. We have all seen pictures of the wall running through mountains or plains in which it appears as a construction made of brick with towers placed regularly along the structure. This exists on thousands of miles but does not really reflect the variety of periods and materials. These brick constructions are from the last centuries of repairs and expansion of the wall. Under the powerful Ming dynasty that ruled China from Beijing and are also the builders and first occupants of the Forbidden City. But the Great Wall had many other sections. There are doors, trenches, in some parts, there are natural obstacles like mountains and rivers that replace the wall. Many more building materials were used in all the sections. And to understand this history, we need to go back to the origins. So, let's begin our exploration of history. <laughs> 
several millennia earlier, when China had not been unified yet under a single emperor, and began to develop a brilliant and diverse culture. So, when did the history of China begin? If we take the earliest known written records as a starting point, they appeared in the 13th century BC, 33 centuries ago. And at the time, the largest organized state in China that produced these records was ruled by a dynasty called the Sheng. Their kingdom was located in the valley of the Yellow River, the second largest river in China, after the Yangtze River. The Yellow River Valley is generally considered to be the cradle of Chinese civilization. It provided water, fertile land, and a favorable climate to agriculture, where urban centers could form and grow. And this started long before the Sheng, in the Neolithic, that is to say, before the introduction of metallurgy, thousands of years earlier. Different Neolithic cultures appeared and declined, or evolved, during prehistoric times, and China is large. Early cultures also flourished to the south along the Yangtze River. Little is known of these first cultures in China. But when it comes to agriculture, the earliest evidence of cultivated rice has been dated to 8,000 years ago, not long after equivalent discoveries in the Middle East. These cultures practiced farming on a growing scale, and signs of their cultural evolution have been revealed by archaeology. Not only all sorts of crafts and tools, but also cultural productions like pictographs carved in stone, thousands of different symbols or characters like Humans pictured in different activities, gods, animals, stars, the sun, the moon. These symbols could be the ancestors to the early Chinese writing system, and they are seven to eight thousand years old. As in other cradles of civilization, with agriculture came increased population and the potential to support specialist craftsmen and administrators. In the 2nd or the 3rd millennium BC, depending on the regions, the Bronze Age began in China, and the earliest states described in ancient records began to form. They were kingdoms with hereditary kings, and by convention in Chinese history, these kingdoms are named after the ruling dynasty. The first one, the first dynasty that appeared in records that were posterior to its existence, is called the Xia dynasty. Its kingdom would have been inland along the Yellow River. Would have because the existence of this kingdom is a bit uncertain. It is known through posterior records only, and there are archaeological remains that would be consistent with its existence in this region and at this period, 4,000 years ago. But it didn't have a writing system, as far as we know. So there are no contemporary records that prove the existence of a state with a single dynasty and an administration. Writing apparently started later, in the 2nd millennium BC, 
as I said. And thanks to it, the Shang dynasty is much better known. It is believed that its golden age was around the 13th century BC. It is contemporary to the peak of ancient Egypt at the time of the Egyptian New Kingdom. Now this kingdom was just a small fraction of modern China, and the rest was not empty. There were already towns and villages, and a fairly high density of population in the east of the modern country. The population of China in the second millennium BC is estimated in the tens of millions, not much compared with today. But at the time, it was already much more than India, Mesopotamia, Egypt or Mesoamerica. There were probably dozens of smaller clans and entities around the territory of the Sheng. But by the end of the second millennium, a formidable rival appeared, also in the Yellow River Valley, but further west, the Tzu dynasty, which happens to be the longest reigning dynasty in the history of China, because it lasted 800 years. The Tzu controlled a quite large territory, centered on the Yellow River and its tributaries, but by the 8th century BC, their kingdom began to fracture, and they lost much of their influence even though they didn't disappear. A process of fragmentation appeared all across China, and eventually, in a few decades, so many local leaders took their independence that there were hundreds of states in China, some of them no bigger than a village or a fort. These micro-states were annexed or allied between them, so larger entities replaced them, that were often in conflict. This period of fragmentation and infighting lasted for several centuries. The last two centuries are called the Warring States period. During it, there were seven prominent states, seven kingdoms, and as many dynasties, that fought for several generations, until one of them, the Qin, prevailed and unified China for the first time. The Qin king proclaimed an empire, and so began imperial China at the end of the 3rd century BC. Interestingly for the Great Wall, that didn't exist yet. During all these centuries of recurring wars, the Chinese built a lot of fortifications, including very long walls to protect their frontiers from their Chinese neighbors. These walls were made of stone, or by stamping earth or gravel between board frames they could only withstand the attacks of small arms, like spears or swords. The Iron Age had begun in the 6th century BC, and weaponry was becoming increasingly strong. But they could be very long, dozens of miles. There is no equivalent to this practice of wall building in other civilizations around the world. Pretty much all of sedentary states around the world built fortresses or arranged defensive positions. But no one built such long walls to defend their frontiers. It was possible in China thanks to the number of workers, their availability, because at the time of the warring states the political organization resembled a feudal system so, to an extent, the rulers could dispose of the workforce, and during this long period of wars, sometimes frontiers stayed the same for a very long time. 
All of this explains how the building of walls became so important in China. When the warring states were unified, conquered by the first emperor, Qin Shi Huang, his empire had plenty of these sections of walls that divided it. Following the frontiers of the former states, so he ordered their destruction because he wanted to centralize China and avoid the resurgence of feudal lords that dominated the previous period. Only the northern sections of the wall were kept, restored and even expanded to protect against the people from the north. At the time, the idea behind the building of these new walls was not to fix the frontier once and for all. Qin Shi Huang was a conqueror. The building of the wall was as much a protection as a base to expand further and possibly build another wall further north. In a previous story, I told you about the spectacular tomb of Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor, near the city of Xi'an, in the west of China, the capital of the Qin. It is mostly known for the terracotta army, thousands of life-size terracotta figures that guard his tomb in and around an underground palace. This was a major work, but not the largest or the most labor-intensive ordered by the first emperor. The northern wall was. Some parts of it were older and dated from earlier centuries. These were restored and connected along the frontier, with hundreds of miles added. The wall was not the same everywhere. Given the distances, the builders tried to use local resources. Over or near mountain ranges, stone was used. Whereas in plains, the wall was built with rammed earth. Nowadays, very few sections of this ancient wall still exist. Some were replaced, or the materials were reused. But for the most part, the walls have eroded along the centuries and almost disappeared. They were not always repaired and kept in a good state, because south of the wall, even though Imperial China lasted for more than 2000 years, it had a very even full history. So let's look at what happened to Imperial China after Qin Shi Huang and its foundation. The first emperor reigned only 12 years on an unified China. An unified China, but his empire only covered the eastern part of the modern country, which was the most populated, and the core of the Han Chinese homeland. The Han Chinese are an ethnic group, and since the beginning of Chinese history, they have dominated demographically. A lot of Chinese imperial dynasties were ethnically Han. It is still the largest group in China today, and also in the world. It accounts for about 18% of the world's population. But not all dynasties were Han, because some of them were founded by invaders, like the Yuan or Mongol dynasty after the Mongol invasion, or the Qing, the Manchu dynasty, the last one. But due to its size, its population, and its culture, China always managed to uh, absorb its conquerors 
rather than become like them. The country was just too large and too populated to quickly change. By the time of the first emperor, China now had a population estimated to 60 million, as much as the Roman Empire at its peak. It had its traditions. The writing system was now already ancient. It kept evolving, but the centralization in the empire unified the Chinese heartland culturally, economically, legally. The passing of centuries cemented this, and for foreigners, the only viable way of controlling China became to transform themselves into Chinese dynasties, claiming the heritage and becoming more Chinese themselves. This is why, even though in the following 2000 years, China was sometimes fragmented and had to be reunified. The various provinces or regions of Han China never drifted apart too much culturally. There was always a sense that they were part of the same empire, even when dynasties changed. And it didn't take very long for a new dynasty to emerge, because shortly after the death of Qin Shi Huang, the Qin dynasty fell, and it was replaced by a new one, the Han. For more than 400 years, until the beginning of the 3rd century AD, the Han stayed on their throne, and at their peak, they ruled an empire that expanded its frontiers and mostly kept peace internally. After centuries of intermittent warfare, this peace brought a golden age for China, a bit like the peace kept by the Roman Empire in the second century in another part of the world, almost at the same time. I told you before about the Han as an ethnic group, and now the Han dynasty. This is not a coincidence. The ethnicity was named after the dynasty, because of the lasting impact of this period on Chinese culture, art, history and science. Sometimes there is this preconception in the West that ancient China was very conservative and rejected all sorts of innovations or was uninterested in the rest of the world. This can make sense at the time when Europeans multiplied contacts with China and the, the last two dynasties, the Ming and the Qing but certainly not for the Han period, which was a time of discoveries, of exploration, of theorization, and artistic creation too. Speaking of culture and tradition, one aspect of the period was the diffusion, sponsored by the state, of a very important system of thought and behavior, Confucianism. Let's stop on this for a minute, because it is a key aspect of Chinese culture and history. Where does it come from and why is it important? Confucius was a Chinese philosopher and politician who lived in the 6th and 5th centuries BC at the time when China was fragmented and 300 years before the unification and proclamation of the empire. He left a lot of writings. It is unclear which ones exactly, because a lot were attributed to him later. But what matters more is the doctrine 
he formulated during this time of war and instability. The context is important because a lot of this doctrine has to do with the goal of establishing a harmonious and peaceful society. So he proposed a number of principles and guidance for human society to reach this goal. Is Confucianism a philosophy, a religion, a humanistic or rationalistic thought system, or simply a way of life, it doesn't necessarily fall into one of these modern categories, but it contains elements from each of them. Confucianism shows a little interest in mysticism or spiritual life, it doesn't talk about an afterlife, either. It recommends respecting and worshipping ancestors, but it doesn't promise another life after death, or doesn't recommend to worship a pantheon. Actually, it can be compatible with a religion. It is more interested in human activities, and, according to some scholars, it tends to transfer the sacred, that for most religions is a world out of our reach, at least not during our lifetimes. It transfers it to our secular world. The sacred is in the ordinary activities of human life. Human activities and relationships are seen as a manifestation of the sacred. That is a quite revolutionary way of seeing things, very different from the Western antique philosophical tradition or antique religions around the world. This is why, as I said before, it can also be called a humanistic school of thought, in the sense that it puts human beings at the center and eliminates the notion that they have to worship one or several gods that created the world or will judge them after death. It is not anti-religious either, just more centered on the human beings. And because what matters more to humans in this system is social harmony, Confucianism is big on recommendations on how it can be achieved through mutual respect. The most famous principle attributed to Confucius is do not do unto others what you do not want done to yourself. Also through personal morality, the rejection of corruption, lie, any kind of crime through kindness, correctness in social relationships. Correctness here means respect and obedience, because the Confucian model society has a clear hierarchy. Families are the most important social group, and within families, the younger respects the elder, the son respects the parent. The wife respects the husband, and the hierarchy extends to society. Subjects obey to their rulers. As long as each person follows the principles of morality and kindness and respect, including towards people they have authority on, this is supposed to preserve harmony. It reflects a rather optimistic view of human beings. And generally, Confucianism believes that men have a good nature. They are predisposed to do good around them. They can be educated and redeem their mistakes. When we compare Confucianism to modern Western thought systems, it is at the same time close and incredibly modern on some aspects, and on other aspects very far. 
for example, on individualism. It is close in the sense that Confucianism tends to leave religion out of the field of philosophy and is a form of humanism in the sense that it puts humans and their well-being at the center of its preoccupations. There are also humanist schools of thought in Western tradition, but they flourished 2,000 years later, or more accurately, maybe some of their ideas or their seeds were present in Greek philosophy, but they were eclipsed for a very long time in dominant thought until the European Renaissance. On the other hand, Confucianism clashes with uh, notions like individualism, and to the average modern person living in a, a liberal democracy, this is a bit hard to swallow. There is no individualism in Confucianism. Family and society is what matters. This means there is no such thing as the right for individuals to uh, criticize or challenge social order. They have to fit in and accept submission to their families, their leaders, to what is expected of them based on the circumstances of their life. The happiness and self-accomplishment they are promised is essentially through their participation in a harmonious society and the accomplishment of a correct destiny. Correct meaning scrupulously following the rules of society and never challenge them unless they are morally unacceptable. All this doesn't leave much room for what we call individual liberty today, like choosing one's own path or having individual ambitions. And logically so, because these rules are made to avoid disturbance and challenges to harmony and stability. To a Confucian scholar from the Han period, 2000 years ago, the idea that someone will want to leave a mark in the world or change it would have been a, a bit outrageous. Who do you think you are with your inflated sense of self that could bring disaster on society? So, for example, to a modern libertarian, the social aspect of Confucianism is unacceptable. It is like an end farm model, thought to keep society stable, as opposed to a model designed to let every man choose their destiny and their own pursuit of happiness on their own terms. Ideas don't pop up randomly. In the case of Confucianism, these principles were formulated, synthesized and expanded by Confucius, but they slowly appeared before him. He received a long legacy that started with all the dynasties, like the Shang and the Tzu, that we already talked about before. They are the product of necessity for a part. China, in the 5th century, was faced with fragmentation endemic war, disorder, and what mattered the most was the restoration of a degree of harmony. So Confucianism offers plenty of recommendations for individuals about how they should behave and their moral standards. But beyond that, it is a school of thought designed to make society hold together. According to uh, some of its critiques, to the point of being uh, infantilizing, 
it is much bigger on obedience and respect than on invitations to think by yourself. Now these are just some of the broad lines of Confucianism, because after his death, Confucius was very influential and inspired many different schools of thought in Chinese philosophy or in political thinking. Confucianism diversified, becoming more religious, more philosophical, or redefined as just a way of life, a way to conduct oneself. It spread to most of China and beyond, to Japan, Korea, Vietnam, in the Chinese diaspora. It is one element that shaped East Asian societies or Chinese communities around the world. It doesn't mean they can be reduced to it to explain how Chinese or Japanese societies functioned to this day. There were other influences, including other philosophies, even though none was probably as influential. And there is always the gap between principles and actual practices. Christianity fully dominated medieval Europe, but it doesn't mean the Ten Commandments were always respected. It would have been more peaceful, probably. The same applies to China. Confucianism rose to prominence, but it didn't erase individual ambitions, crime, revolts, and it certainly didn't end civil wars in China as we are going to see in the following centuries. However, from the Han period, that lasted until the 3rd century AD, Confucianism became an official doctrine promoted by the state. Under the Han, the Great Wall was not abandoned. It was repaired and expanded not as much as under the first emperor, but as the main and almost the only external threat to the empire came from the north, it was kept in good conditions. The Han dynasty had its peak in the first and beginning of the second century AD. After that, they declined financially because the state had sold more and more land to uh, aristocrats and wealthy families, and as a result, its fiscal income had shrinked. There were feuds at the court, too, around easily influenced emperors. Rebellions broke out, and a long period of troubles began at the end of the second century. The Han dynasty disappeared a few decades later, and in the 3rd century, the empire broke up. For most of the 3rd century, it was fractioned into three kingdoms, three dynasties. This is called the Three Kingdoms period, the Wei, Shu, and Wu. A reunification took place in the 4th century, the Jin dynasty, but it didn't last long, and for two more centuries, China exploded again, until another reunification and the rise of a new powerful dynasty, the Tang. Another golden age was about to begin, but not for the Great Wall. Since the end of the Han dynasty, 500 years earlier, it had been mostly neglected because there were other priorities and several times people north of the wall had crossed to establish kingdoms in the north of China, meaning that it was no longer on the frontier. 
so its importance had declined. As I said, the Tang period, which lasted for 300 years, was another high point in Chinese history. A powerful central authority was restored, and an internal peace came back, whereas Imperial China reached a, a never-seen-before expansion geographically. Once again, like at the time of the Han, science, technology, and uh, crafts flourished. For example, it is under the Tang that black powder was invented in the 9th century. China at the time was quite outward-looking. Its leaders certainly didn't have much doubt about their superiority, but still, they favored uh, international trade, the Silk Road to the Muslim world was secured again. Ports in the south of China prospered thanks to trade. They sent embassies. Chinese travelers went to India. Buddhism had spread in China and become the main religion in popular classes, competing with Taoism. Both Buddhism and Taoism do not necessarily fit into the Western or Middle Eastern definition of religion. They imply a number of beliefs, faith is involved, but there are also philosophical traditions that offer a way of life. Taoism began to emerge in the 4th century BC and it shares similarities with Confucianism in the sense that it emphasizes the search for earthly perfection. It is very practical, and the name reflects this. Tao means the way, the path, and it invites to cultivate simplicity, humility, compassion, as ways of living in harmony with the substance of everything that exists. This is where it differs from Confucianism, which has a social doctrine that is a bit rigid, and this is something that Taoism does not really deal with. But the two doctrines grew up in the same cultural background. The Tang maintained large armies and they paid little attention to the Great Wall that continued to deteriorate. Some sections were even entirely forgotten. Their capital was in Xi'an, at the time the most populated city in the world. It was far from the northern frontier and spending a fortune on the Great Wall never appeared as a priority. By the end of the reign of the Tang, in the 10th century, a much more pressing issue was that the empire was falling apart again. A new age of warlords and competing dynasties began, despite efforts to reunite China. For another 300 years, China fragmented and five main states replaced the empire of the Tang until the 13th century. This is the situation that the Mongols, led by Genghis Khan, found when they began their extraordinary expansion out of Mongolia. I will not elaborate much more on this tonight, because it is in the story about Genghis Khan and the Mongols. In a few years, the various kingdoms of China were overwhelmed, one after the other, and the new masters of China became foreigners. Foreigners that, in a sense, China conquered culturally. 
to control it. They had to replace former emperors. And due to its demographic and economic weight, China became the new center of the Mongol Empire. This Mongol dynasty, the Yuan, lasted until the 14th century, when they lost their throne to a rebel who founded a new dynasty, the Ming. The Ming moved their capital to Beijing in the north of China. Now this is also something I told you about in the story about the Forbidden City and the last five centuries of Imperial China. And with the Ming began a new era for the Great Wall. This fortification was irrelevant to the Mongols. Once they had invaded China, it didn't stop their invasion because it had been mostly neglected for a long time. And then, after the invasion, it became a fortification line within their empire. So they ignored it and it kept turning into a ruin. The Ming saw things very differently. Even though the Mongols had been expelled from China and their empire was falling apart, the heart of Mongolia to the northwest of China was still a potential threat. Memories of the invasion a century earlier were still fresh and an intermittent conflict with Mongolic tribes went on for decades after the Ming took power. So one of the Ming's priorities was to protect against invaders from the north. And the concept of a defensive wall was revived. All the more that the Ming army lost a major battle to the Oirats, the Mongolic people, in the 15th century. They concluded that they had to set a frontier and hold it rather than fight a never-ending war in this vast expanse beyond China. The Ming started a restoration and expansion project of the Great Wall that was even more voluntarist than Qin Shi Huang 17 centuries earlier. Instead of rammed earth in the plains, the walls would be rebuilt in stone and brick, and the sections near Beijing were made especially strong to protect the capital. 25,000 watchtowers were constructed on the wall to warn of approaching Mongol raiders. The Chinese were well aware that the wall was not going to stop a large raid. It can be breached, or earth can be added on both sides to allow the passage of horses. The idea was more to dissuade small raids, let the Mongols know that this was the line not to be crossed, and also gain time in case of attack to warn that an invasion was taking place so that troops behind the line would be mobilized and move to protect the border. The aspect of the Great Wall on most photos or the most visited parts of it that are located north of Beijing owe everything to the Ming period. This is when the wall became more uniform and adopted this architecture with a succession of towers, the top of the wall being like an elevated road that could be used to patrol and move along it. It ran to the sea because the Mongols were not the only danger. To the east were the Manchus, 
towards the end of the Ming, in the late 16th century. The biggest concern was no longer the Mongols, but a Manchu invasion that began around 1600. The Great Wall and fortifications built to the north really helps contain them. Only in 1644 would the invaders cross the wall for conquest. They had crossed it before, but only for reds with small groups. This time it was the main army for conquest and the empire of the Ming was already collapsing when the Manchu launched their final attack. Beijing had fallen to an army of rebels when the Manchu arrived. They eliminated the rebels in China and the remaining Ming resistance. Once again, China had fallen to foreigners. The new dynasty, the Qing, controlled both the south and north of the wall. Manchuria was their homeland, and Mongolia was finally defeated and annexed by them, which rendered the Great Wall irrelevant again. The wall was, of course, not forgotten, because its presence was obvious, but it was neglected, and its historical significance didn't attract that much attention. In the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, it deteriorated further. But at the same time, its fame grew around the world. More and more travelers, Chinese and foreigners alike, saw it and realized the monumental scale of the building. This caused a bigger impression worldwide. Scholars and then the public realized that the Great Wall was just the biggest building ever built by man. Further research in the 20th century, including recently, has unveiled a totally forgotten segment, the older ones, that had been entirely lost to desertic regions or mountains. The wall has been measured to about half the circumference of Earth. It impressed so much that sometimes there are exaggerations. For example, this legend that it is visible to the naked eye from space. But it isn't, even on a low orbit. Because even though the wall is very long, it is not wide. It has the width of a small house. Seeing it from space would be like seeing a thread at a distance of several hundred yards. It is impossible. Some of the sections, especially north of Beijing, are protected and taken care of. But the monument is just too large to be entirely preserved. In many locations, the wall is in disrepair and has been in that state since at least the 16th century. Parts have been destroyed to make way for construction or mining. In other parts, there are strong signs of erosion due to the weather, especially sandstorms. Sometimes the height of the wall has diminished from 16, 17 feet originally to 6 to 7 feet, especially in the western sections that are made from mud and exposed to more erosion. Large parts of the wall run through remote regions 
far from the intense activity of Chinese cities. These are hardly ever visited, and as the seasons and years pass, they wait in silence that the weather and the passing of time finish to erase them. We have reached the end of our journey for tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. You can now let go and fall asleep, or if you prefer, choose another story from my library. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll come back soon with another story. And in the meantime, sweet dreams. Au revoir.